You sure do. Okay. <laughs> Tons of them. Okay. We're rolling. <laughs> All right. This is an interview at the Best Western Hotel, Buffalo, New York, 22nd of February, 2006, approximately 8.45 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you, could you give me your full name, date of birth, place of birth, please? Uh, my name is Frank R. Bartolotta. Uh, my date of birth is 2-14-43, and I was born in Buffalo, New York. Okay. Um, what was your uh, educational background prior to entering service? Um, I graduated from Lakeshore Central High School in um, June of 61, uh, and I entered uh, in the Navy in uh, September. I was on the delayed entry program. Uh, I turned 18 in February, just prior to graduation, and signed up for the for to volunteer for the Navy, uh, with the uh, expectation of leaving in September. Okay, so you enlisted. Why did you enlist, and why did you enlist in the Navy? Well, I chose the Navy because uh, most of my family had been in the Navy. I had uh, two uncles. Uh, my mother's two brothers are uh, were are veterans of the, the uh, Marine Corps. I had an uncle who was with the um, he was with the U.S. Navy. He was a uh, retired Navy. I uh, spent 22 years in the Navy. Uh, that was my grandmother's youngest brother. And he had a great influence on uh, which, uh, which um, service I selected. Mm -hmm. And um, my great-grandfather was a merchant marine. He was a cook aboard one of the merchant ships. And uh, also my mother's oldest brother uh, served uh, for over 20 years in the Navy. So her three brothers, uh, all, all three of her brothers served either with the Marine Corps or the Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course at the time uh, we had a military draft facing us in 61. It was uh, universal military subscription, uh, what is it called, uh, you know, uh, conscription at the mm -hmm. time. So uh, I uh, thought about it and I thought it would best serve uh, myself to uh, join the Navy. and. Uh, also, it was a great time to be in the service at the time. We thought it was a good thing to serve your country. Okay. Um, where did you go for your basic training? I went to Great Lakes. At the time when I went in the Navy, there were two um, naval training centers for recruits. One was uh, the Great Lakes Naval Training Center in um, uh, just uh, between Milwaukee and Chicago in a place called uh, Waukegan, Illinois, outside of Waukegan. And then there is uh, the second one was in uh, uh, San Diego, California. Okay, um, how, could you tell us about your basic training, how long was um, it Basic last? training was supposed to be nine weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, the Naval uh, for Enlisted Men at the time was nine weeks. I was there 12 uh, because it took three weeks to get us organized into companies. Uh, at the time, in 1961, uh, if uh, some people remember, uh, Khrushchev was banging his shoe on the podium in, in um, uh, at the UN and uh, of course uh, there was talk about uh, missiles in Cuba. So we had the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, which was looming. Uh, Kennedy had just been elected president. Uh, there was a, a second Berlin crisis going on in 61. They had already shut off early in, or late in uh, 48 or 49 there was the original Berlin crisis. And then um, there was a second Berlin crisis that were talking about closing off the uh, borders and uh, the route between West Germany and East Germany at the time, uh, connecting you with West Berlin. So uh, there was a lot of tension and the possibility of going to war. And uh, actually, to be honest with you, that was one of the reasons I thought it was necessary to serve at that time. If my country was going to need me, I certainly wanted to be there and trained. So uh, I joined the Navy and it took us three weeks to get uh, a company formed, which was uh, a bit <laughs> disconcerting at the time because uh, we didn't have enough uniforms. They had, and they were building up. It was a massive buildup at the time. And what they did was they uh, gave us watch caps, which are the little black knitted caps, mm -hmm. and we put the black knitted caps on, and that was our full uniform. We had to stay in our civilian clothes for three weeks, which we were supposed to stay in them for about three days and then ship them home. Well, by the time I ship those clothes home, they were fit for nothing. <laughs> My mother threw them right out because uh, we didn't just didn't have the necessary facilities. We could wash out our skivvies and our socks, but that was about it. Uh, Navy was, uh, I enjoyed the Navy. Uh, the Navy was, uh, for me, was a, a tremendous experience. Um, having been a young man and had never, my first train ride was uh, riding the train from uh, the DLNW uh, uh, train station here at the foot of uh, 
Maine and uh, South Park. Uh, there was the, I guess it was called Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. Uh, we took that train ride, and that was the first one. It was a Pullman berth. Uh, it was actually like a little, like a little cabinet where you had uh, your own room, and it was great. And then you had, uh, uh, for a boy 18 years old, I mean, that's just fantastic. Um, and they had a club car, and you, at the time, uh, legally, drinking age was uh, 18, so I could, in New York. So we had a, you know, a beer before, uh, before retiring for the night. Uh, played some cards. It was just a great time. Um, and then, of course, uh, we didn't realize that uh, Vietnam was looming in the background. I spent eight years in the Navy, um, two, almost two full tours. Uh, each tour normally is four years, mm -hmm. uh, four to six years, and I put in two. I had um, enlisted in the Navy, as I said, in 61, and I was discharged in April of 69. Um, when I was uh, in the, uh, of course, I didn't know what particular specialty I wanted to, what we called strike for. Uh, but um, I was, so when I was uh, interviewed at the recruit training command, I told him, I says, I don't care what it is as long as it's not below decks. I, <laughs> I wasn't comfortable with all the mechanics and uh, what we used to call uh, motorheads or grease monkeys who worked down below decks. They were the firemen. Um, they're... Uh, they used to work like they were like boiler makers, uh, boiler makers, uh, plumbers, uh, people that work below the decks. And as if you've ever been aboard ship, it looks like one big plumbing maze because everything is uh, between the uh, between the water lines, the, the discharge lines, the air lines, the all even all the electrical lines are encased in uh, in pipes because they have no open cords mm -hmm. anywhere or wires. And as a result, it looks, inside ships look like just, just huge mazes. And they always have to be available to be worked on so they're not covered like mm -hmm. they normally would be in civilian life. Um, my tours took me from um, 12 weeks at uh, Great Lakes, and, uh, at Great Lakes Recruit Training Command. And then I was sent on a temporary assignment because, again, because there were so many men coming in, men and women, that uh, hospital core school, which I decided, uh, or they decided for me, I didn't actually decide it, they decided for me was one of the best opportunities for me. So they uh, s scheduled me to become a hospital corpsman, so I was automatically considered a hospital and apprentice upon a graduation from boot camp, where normally you're a seaman apprentice, which is a E2. Um, there were dentalman apprentice, dental technician apprentice, there were hospital corps apprentice because the hospital corps is very unique in the Navy. It's the only enlisted corps in the entire Navy. It's a special corps by itself and it is an enlisted corps. Um, we're, uh, it's actually a special program. Um, so I was uh, excited about it and I said we're going to become a hospital corpsman. But unfortunately the classes were filled until at, again at Great Lakes. Uh, but this was Great Lakes what they called hospital side which is where they have the Great Lakes Hospital, and uh, the the hospital corpsman training programs are uh, are there. Those are sixteen week courses, what they call or sixteen weeks uh, schools, and um, that's called an A school in the Navy. Uh, that's your first um, basic school for your particular rating, and um, so I was uh, selected to go there, but unfortunately not to start until the following September. So from December, when I graduated from boot camp, until September, I was assigned to the um, Naval Base, uh, Naval Marine, or excuse me, Naval Submarine Base in Groton, Connecticut, New London, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. We were on the Groton side of the river. And uh, they assigned me to the medical research lab there, which was just a entry-level thing. They had to keep me busy. So uh, because I had taken uh, some courses in the, in the high school, regarding graphic arts and printing, they assigned me to the graphic arts division. And what I did was I printed manuals and uh, helped the civilians that were assigned to um, print all of the training manuals and all of the experimental work that they were doing at the medical research lab. At the time they were developing, uh, they had these uh, very tall towers that they used as uh, to simulate underwater uh, de depths of up to 100 feet or more. And uh, they were uh, they were using it for experimental research uh, to assist in uh, naval warf in uh, submarine naval warfare and uh, for survival for the uh, for the sailors. So I t I worked there for 
uh, eight months, nine months, which was great because I got to see most of uh, southern New England, coastal New England, with uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. It was wonderful. Um, I had found out that I had some relatives in Mass, so I was or uh, Connecticut, so I was able to visit with them in Rhode Island. And uh, we've ultimately, with my family, have gone back many times to all the places I've been stationed, just to show my children and uh, or our children what uh, you know what areas there were. Uh, most of the bases, unfortunately, are all closed. Mm -hmm. Almost every every place I've served has uh, been discontinued. My next assignment after that was the Hospital Corps School, Great Lakes, Illinois. I was there for 16 weeks, and um, there were um, I was the t uh, class adjutant. The class adjutant is like the uh, military leader for the class, and um, you're given the responsibility of making sure the class arrives on time for their assignments. Uh, uh, barracks inspections and all the things that are responsible. You are, in fact, the uh, ch the chief of your class. Um, I did that for the 16 weeks. They selected me to be the um, adjutant, and we had a company commander who was the chief petty officer, um, hospital corps chief petty officer, and we had a a um, nurse. Uh, the nurse was an officer. She was a lieutenant commander, and she was in charge of our class. So there was everything was organized by military rank. Well, I was the the top ranked uh, student. Well, the top ranked student and the top scholastic scoring student in school, after the 16 weeks, were given the reward for their extra work, uh, which was considerably uh, more work than the average student. Um, we were given our choice of orders, which meant there were 50 uh, students in my class. There were 26 men and uh, 24 women. They were uh, what they call uh, hospital core waves at the time. Uh, and um, the um, two who select were selected, that was the adjutant and the top scholastic scoring student, were given their set of or the, their um, choice of orders. They went and brought us into a room just as they said they would, and uh, they laid out all the orders for various hospitals, like hospital assignments, shipboard assignments, and you were allowed to pick your assignment. Well, some of the what we call old salts in the Navy, those are guys who had spent better than 20 or 30 years in the Navy, they said if you can get a military sea transportation service, if they offer them, when you graduate, grab those orders because it's great duty. They called them floating hotels. Well, they weren't quite floating hotels, but they were really good duty, uh, except that you put an awful lot of time at, at sea. Um, my next two years at sea, I was assigned to the military sea tree, uh, excuse me, it's called the Military Sea Transportation Service out of um, Brooklyn Army Terminal. We were uh, in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn, just below the, what is now the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Uh, as a matter of fact, I saw it uh, from the, uh, the complete construction stage each time I went in and out of port. Um, I made 25 trips to Germany um, in less than 24 months. So as you can see, every three weeks we were back in Germany, and every three weeks we were back in the States. The normal trip took uh, seven days in the summer and eight days in the winter because of much worse weather. Um, North Atlantic can be pretty rough. Now what were you doing aboard ship? I was a hospital corpsman. I was assigned to the hospital. We mm -hmm. had a full, to describe that, it was like, um, like a small town, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had uh, about 2,700 troops. Now that would be from privates. They were all army, almost always. There were a few smaller contingents that would sometimes were assigned to our ship to get them, get them to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, our um, the the bulk of the ship was made up of 286 civilian crew members. They were merchant marine. They worked for the U.S. government. Uh, they wore uniforms similar to. Uh, Navy uniforms, only different insignia, uh, which confused the Army troops to no end. They thought they were all admirals. <laughs> they were even saluting the deckhands. <laughs> and uh, we had uh, 286 crew members. We had 26 military. Now that's 26 Navy. And the Navy, as I remember, we had about eight hospital corpsmen, two Corps waves, a uh, Navy nurse who was almost always female. The Navy hadn't... Uh, the Navy was the least progressive of the services. They didn't have male nurses in there yet. Um, 
so they had a, the nurse was always a female. Uh, she was a commissioned officer. And then you had two physicians. They were medical officers. They were in the Naval Reserve. They were usually uh, uh, full lieutenants, would be like a captain in the Army. And um, then we had uh, two officers that were what they call line officers. Now, these were the officers, if you remember the, the Naval uniform, they have a star above their stripes on their sleeves. They're line officers, usually in command of ships and command of, uh, of installations. And they were rather than like a supply corps or one of the corps officers. And they, um, they were usually an ensign or second lieutenant who was the executive officer of the military unit, uh, which doesn't sound like a very big job when you think there's only 26 military. And then you had a lieutenant commander. We called them, they were referred to in the Navy as Mustangs. They were uh, naval lieutenant commanders who was their last assignment. They were usually uh, enlisted men during World War II. Because don't forget, it was only 16 years after the end of World War II, um, 16, 17 years. So many of these men had entered as young men in World War II and then stayed in the Navy, and they were recruited. And then they were ultimately promoted to the officer's ranks, the attended uh, officer candidates to a school. And uh, they would then become, um, they rise, usually rise as high as a uh, junior officer, which is lieutenant commander, which would be like a major in the Army. And that's as far as they normally would go. That was their last assignment. They were our uh, commanding officer. But their job was to coordinate and to be responsible for every military passenger on the ship. So now we're talking 25, 2,600 troop members, 250 civilian women on average that were wives, and then at least an, of the servicemen that were overseas that we were taking with us, and at least uh, 250 children or more sometimes as many as 400 children. So uh, it was a small city. I mean, we had all of the same problems that as regular, you know, who is, gets cold, who falls, who gets hurt, uh, you know, who gets seasick. I mean, there was all kinds of different problems that, you're going, that you can encounter in a seven or eight day period. Uh, my assignment was to work in the emergency room. Uh, we called it sick bay or sick call. We'd have sick call twice a day. 8 o'clock in the morning and 7 o'clock at night. Evening sick call was at 7. Uh, or as they had said then, 1,900 hours. And uh, people would could come in to uh, anyone on the ship could come in and uh, avail themselves of any medical service that they thought they might need. And uh, we would assist them. We had an operating room. We had um, delivery room. We didn't expect to deliver very many babies because we made sure that was one of the things that we had to do. If a woman was over six months pregnant, and she was being transported overseas, she'd have to go by plane, which was uh, the Military Air Transportation Service, MATS. If they were um, over six months preg uh, pregnant, or if the baby was less than six weeks old, they had to be flown over by MATS, or they have to wait until the baby was old enough to fly, or until the woman delivered, and then she could mm -hmm. fly, and then she could go to, uh, she could take the, the uh, troop class ships. Uh, I did some more research on it, and I found out that uh, Military Sea Transportation Service had been around since 1950, um, when the Navy took back the responsibility of transporting troops for the Army primarily. We did get a few interesting um, uh, groups on the ship. We used to get uh, retired men who uh, had spent time in the service and retired, and they could come over space available if there was space on the ship. They would get an opportunity to take the shipboard ride to... Um, or cruise directly to Europe, and then they would spend time in Europe during the summer. We had some school teachers uh, who had the summers off, uh, or some would take in sabbaticals, and they'd go into Europe and spend two, three months in Europe, and then go back uh, for basically what they called commuted rations, which was about a hundred, which was about a dollar seventy-five cents a day uh, for the food. You didn't pay for the trip at all if you were retired military, which was great. Um, so we got some interesting people there. Um, our dental needs, and uh, they were usually attended to by uh, a Naval Reserve dentist. They would count the three weeks of the tour, of one trip over and one trip back. That would be their two weeks of active duty So the, each year, so they would serve, and they would come aboard ship, and we would have, you know, every other trip or so, we'd have a dentist aboard. Uh, we had a chaplain, full-time chaplain aboard. So altogether, 
uh, 26 military, 286 or so crew members. They actually ran the ship. And then uh, the coordination was between our um, uh, military. As I said, there were eight uh, corpsmen, two waves usually, a chief bosun's mate. He was what they called master at arms. He was the police force for the military. He made sure that everything ran the way it's supposed to, that maintained order. And his primary duty was assigned to the, keeping the troops, because they were in uh, level four, th uh, three and four. Uh, that was the third deck below main deck. They were in third deck and the fourth deck. That's where they sleep like three and five high. And uh, it's not such a nice place. <laughs> now, now, as a, a corpsman, what, what could you do? Dispense medications? or Yes, what was we had a lot of leeway. Uh, mm -hmm. Because um, I wasn't an independent duty corpsman yet. Mm -hmm. I was just a basic corpsman. I had just graduated from school, of course. Uh, but we were allowed, as a corpsman, uh, we were allowed to... Um, start IVs, uh, you know, with, uh, of course, if the doctor ordered it, right. they'd say, all right, start an IV. We did, basically, we did pretty much most of the registered, what, would, what I would consider responsibility of registered nurses in civilian life. We'd start IVs, give inoculations, uh, immunizations, chart, keep the charts, um, vaccinations, um, lance, cis, lance them, pack them, um, what else did we do? Because I did a pineal cyst, I've done pretty much, I've aspirated a knee, elbow, you know, damaged knees, damaged elbows with uh, fluid on the knee. Um, if we were properly trained, which I ended up staying and becoming an x-ray technologist, that's why I put the second tour in. Um, if you had an x-ray technician aboard or a lab tech, like we had a pharmacy and lab tech aboard, he was a second class petty officer and he taught me how to dispense medication. Um, and I, we would be assigned to him for say two weeks and then I would learn how to dispense medication so that if I was the only duty corpsman on at the time, I could then take the keys, go into the pharmacy, select the medication as per the prescription written by the doctor, stamp it, put it in there, dis and actually dispense the medication. We try to be as, of course, as careful as you could. Um, and uh, usually we didn't have any problems. We also, uh, what we did aboard ship was uh, we had a brig. A brig is uh, like, a, like a little jail, a little jail cell. Um, and every once in a while somebody would end up landing in the brig. It was usually if there was a fight or if there was something uh, below decks or even if a civilian, even one of the civilian crew members, uh, you know, got out of, got out of hand, uh, they'd lock him in the brig for a few days. So then if somebody was in the brig, then you had to do what they called brig sick call. And that meant that you, uh, twice a day, you'd have to go visit the prisoner and make sure that all his medical needs were taken, were taken care of. As a hospital corpsman aboard ship, you have a unique um, um, responsibility and authority. The authority is that you are allowed to go, and I don't know if it's still the same in the Navy, but I imagine it still is, is you're allowed to go anywhere in the ships, uh, in the sh on the ship itself. There is nowhere that's off limits to you unless it's extreme security clearance and the captain's quarters. But other than that, no, but you can still go in the captain's quarter by invitation or if the medical officer, if there is a medical officer aboard this uh, ship you're on, orders you to go in there, he has, uh, he has the ability to do that. And that's only for environmental safety and health. Because a ship is such a small uh, contained area, um, their health is extremely important. Uh, sanitation is extremely important. As you can imagine, if you uh, get uh, someone gets sick and it spreads a disease or germs, or if you have an unsanitary or an unsafe condition, you can disable that ship very, very quickly. And uh, that's very easy to do. Mm -hmm. So my responsibilities at the time were limited to um, dispensing medication, uh, interviewing the, uh, the patient before the doctor saw them, if it was necessary to see the doctor. Dressing wounds, changing dressings, um, that type of thing. You know, it was pretty, it was pretty relaxed. And then in the afternoon, we would have uh, training sessions. Uh, the nurses would give training sessions. The X-ray technician, the lab tech, or whatever, would give classes, and they would assign various classes, and they would teach on the job training and on the job uh, uh, instruction. Mm -hmm. And um, what else did we do? That was basically about it. I did see a couple of interesting units. Um, 
when uh, one of our trips we had what they uh, had never seen before, the Army's Green Beret uh, Division. We had a, not a division, but we actually had a small contingent. Uh, they were isolated. They were kept in uh, in a small confined area of the ship. Uh, they weren't. They didn't mix with the general population at all. Uh, the rest of the regular soldiers. And that what we found out later was that they were um, they were on their way to Germany for special training, and then they were going to be dropped into Vietnam. This was before Vietnam actually mm -hmm. said that they actually had Americans in there. They were then uh, what they were referred to as advisors to the uh, Vietnam Republican Army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What were your quarters like? Um, we had great duty. That's and we had great shipboard quarters uh, compared to regular mm -hmm. compared to regular Navy. Um, we had four men to the because these were converted Liberty ships, mm -hmm. so they converted the lower levels into we were on the second deck, one one deck below the main deck. So uh, second deck we had um, what they called uh, rooms. They had doors like you would normally. Uh, then at the end of the room there was a there was a uh, porthole with a port light, and uh, which is the window and the dead light, which is like a big toilet seat cover that covers it for uh, for inclement weather, for very bad weather, with these large dogs. Then those are the big nuts and a nuts and a bolt that you secure them to keep the sea out. Um, and they were four bunks, two lower, two upper, and they were uh, made out of pipes, basically, uh, with, a, with a mattress set on an area, and then there was all these pipes aboard. Then I realized what those pipes were for. That's so you could lash yourself into the <laughs> into your bed, because when it gets rough in the North Atlantic, we all had uh, these long belts. And what you do is you take the belt after you get in bed, take there in your rack. We call it a rack in the Navy. You take your belt and secure yourself in, because during the night it'll throw you right out on the deck if mm -hmm. it gets uh, rough enough. Um, <clears throat> that happened a few times. I never fell out because I was tied in. But uh, it gets it gets pretty exciting. Um, the room had uh, sink, closets. Well, there were closets. They were basically little lockers like you'd have in school, mm -hmm. like a little gym locker. And that you had that was for your personal stuff, and you could hang your those for your little personal space. Your four bunks, a sink. Then you had to go out and leave the room, go down to the end of the of the passageway. And there was um, a shower room. Uh, showers were limited to one minute. You had to get in, turn the water on, soap up, you know, shut the water off, soap up, turn the water on, rinse, and get out. And even today, I don't take more than a two-minute shower. I just, <laughs> just can't get used to it. <laughs> um, and what else? Uh, we were very fortunate because then, instead of going in the general line, where you go down the line with these hammered-out trays for, for your food, for your meals, we would go to a room uh, that was our dining room, and the dining room was um, for it was called the enlisted dining room. And uh, core waves ate there with us, the men, the hospital corpsmen, and we had uh, the other contingent with us was the were yeomen. We had uh, a yeoman, a personnelman. They kept our records, pay, payroll records, and that. And there was um, yeoman, personnelman, hospital corpsman, and the chief bosun's mate, and that was it. Like I said, there was only 26 of us, and three quarters of that was for the hospital, to man the hospital. And uh, oh, we had a, sh a storekeeper who was in charge of the little store. We had like a little, uh, we call it a little gee dunk. Mm -hmm. And um, you could go there and get, you know, you buy your shaving cream and razors and all that. And they, they made, um, and they had a, some of the ships had soda fountains, I saw them from when I was looking at them, but we didn't have that, or no mm -hmm. such thing. But um, then at night, uh, then, Basically, uh, you know, is what you handled whatever had to be handled. Uh, once everything was done, you had you had breakfast at eight o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning. Um, you got yourself up, you know, and there was no reveille or anything like that. You got yourself up in the morning. You'd uh, get your shower, get shaved, get dressed for uniform of the day. Go over for breakfast at seven o'clock, which is right across the passageway, and you'd have uh, breakfast around seven. Muster at eight. Muster means everybody falls in and uh, make sure everybody's at their assigned uh, position. And uh, sick call at 8.30. Uh, and then if there's nothing else to do, you clean up, lunch. Meals were big things aboard ship, big morale, <coughs> big morale booster. Navy still has the best food, and that's part of it.
because uh, I want to make sure, because you're with all those, with the, all those days at sea, I see it's one of the biggest things is the morale booster of the really great meals. Um, so we would go to, and we had everything. We had a bakery, we had, um, you know, we had a chief cook, and we had, uh, we had a, a full contingent. They used to oh, bake, was that run by the Merchant Marines? Mm -hmm. They baked bread at night. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a night pantry where at, after 10 o'clock you could go down and make yourself a sandwich, uh, get a piece of pie, coffee. It was really supposed to be for the night crew, mm -hmm. but uh, hospitals, again, hospital corpsmen could go anywhere and nobody bothered the dock. I mean, everybody left the dock alone. You were uh, privileged uh, as a hospital corpsman aboard ship because, you know, you controlled everything, shot records. You could easily lose those, and the poor guy would have to get all his shots again. You know, it's just like the paymaster. Mm -hmm. You lose your payroll records, you won't be paid for about four months. And then they finally catch up with it. So, you see, there were a few things that they used to make sure that they took care of the hospital corpsman. And I had one, one interesting, very interesting uh, trip. We... Um, I got a call, we got a message at sea that there was a Greek freighter uh, was in our area and that there was the possibility that one of their crew members had uh, contracted polio. Polio was still from the 50s, but it was still uh, prevalent in other countries in Europe uh, right up through the 60s. So they were very concerned about this because it might spread through the, because they had not been inoculated and they didn't have polio vaccines. and. They were afraid that the entire ship, uh, the younger crew members, were going to come down with polio, and they asked us if we, if, if we were vaccinated, could we go there? And could we? So we thought, you know, how are we going to get to the ship? But we, so they made a transfer. So what we did is we pulled alongside the other ship. Well, not alongside, but mm -hmm. you know, within maybe a quarter of a mile, because right. you can't get too close, because the seas were fairly rough at that particular time, and we didn't want to uh, take the chance of colliding. So, uh, and our ship was large. We had, it was 609 feet long, 75 feet wide. So it was a very large ship. And um, so this was a small Greek freighter. So the doctor, myself, I volunteered. The doctor volunteered. Chief Cook, because he spoke Greek. He was Greek and he spoke uh, fluent Greek. Um, and uh, bosun's mate and our chief engineer, who was, who was going to run the little, um, the little power craft, and they lowered the power craft off the side. They pulled the day of its out, lowered it. We went down, set us free, and then we made our way to the Greek freighter. They brought us aboard and examined the uh, patient. And uh, after the, and thank God we brought the Greek uh, interpreter with us because these men, did, none of the men, of even the, nobody on the ship uh, spoke English. And uh, so uh, after examining him, he couldn't find anything wrong with him. And of course, the Greek uh, cook spoke with him for a while, and it, because this boy was laying in a bed almost paralyzed, and we found out it was just a major anxiety reaction that he was having. It was his first trip away from home. He was extremely homesick. He didn't want to tell his family that he was in that position, and he didn't know what to do. And he just froze. And uh, what appeared to be, you know, stiff neck, stiff joints, inability to move. And it gave all the impressions of polio was in fact uh, an anxiety, or you know what you call an anxiety reaction. So once uh, he got up and everybody was fine, then they were all excited and they invited us up to the captain's quarters, and we had some ouzo, and, we, <laughs> and the men were dancing a little bit and having a good time. And then they they sent us up and they thanked us tremendously. And then uh, we had to make our way back to the ship, which was not an easy task. They're probably the waves at that time were probably about eight or nine feet, and I tell you, in a small dinghy about that only holds five or six men, that's a little bit rough. <laughs> Sometimes when you go down in the, mm -hmm. below the swell, you don't even see your ship, and then obviously you come back up and ride the crest. You say, "Oh, there it is again," and then you back down again. So it's pretty nasty. What were the uh, women's accommodations? Uh, Women had exactly the same thing as our rooms, but their rooms were uh, with the. Um, they had the nurse had her own quarters, and the two core waves shared a quarters, and they were had they had the same rooms as the state rooms for the women and children. Women and children state rooms. You normally, if you say were a woman with two children, you three children, they were you could put four. Some of the rooms held six, but the majority of them held four. So if you had four or less of you, then you could take one of those rooms and it was fine. If there was a single woman by herself, 
um, or you know, married woman without ch uh, children, they did, they'd double them up. You know, they'd share share the accommodations. Um, they didn't pay for any of the uh, for any of the uh, trip. It was all paid for by the government, um, and they had some. They had really really nice. Uh, they had what we called uh, mess stewards. They were uh, civilian employees, and they actually served the meals. Uh, well, uh, of course, crew members cook the meals and everything. They'd serve the meals, so they'd have an enlisted dining room, officer's dining room. Then aboard the, uh, up, up on the upper decks, they had the extra uh, passenger dining rooms. They had passenger dining rooms, and it was just like a, just like a regular passenger ship. It wasn't a love boat, but necessarily, but it was pretty nice. <laughs> but we had uh, uh, the the best time, the best trip was uh, in June and in August, and I found out why. Because in June, all the girls that were going to college in the states would go back to Europe to join their families in Europe that were there, and then of course in August you had to bring them back so they could start school again. So that was the best time. <laughs> A lot of 18, 19, 20 year old girls there board ship, so it was kind of nice. Mm -hmm. They had, uh, then we would, the first thing they would do is organize anybody that uh, was in the army that played instruments, they'd put a band together, and then we'd have, they'd practice for three or four days of the of the uh, cruise, and then the last two, three days they would have dances at night, which was nice, you know, for the passengers and and uh, not necessarily the crew members and, and uh, regular soldiers couldn't go up there, but all the, what they called the passenger class, which were E5 soldiers, which would be sergeants and above, and their uh, and their families, mm -hmm. and of course hospital corpsmen go anywhere, so we were always there. <laughs> now you said you were with the transportation service two years. Um, mm -hmm. Two yeah, years, at and the then at, that, uh, at the end of that, I uh, went to X-ray school. I was assigned. I, my orders came through for X-ray school uh, at uh, U.S. Naval Hospital, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which no longer is there. But uh, that's where I was assigned. X-ray school was one full year of classroom and practical application. And then you had to give the Navy three years after that because the school was uh, one full year and three years uh, as, a, as the trade-off. Uh, most civilian schools uh, for X-ray technology are normally two years, but we have an accelerated course. And it is fully accredited and approved. The Navy course was fully accredited and approved by the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists. I worked for a short time as a licensed x-ray technologist when I came back from the Navy. Okay. After x-ray school in Philadelphia, which was one year, uh, during that year, halfway through the year, my wife and I married, and my wife joined me in Philadelphia. How was she from the Buffalo area? She was or? from Buffalo, mm -hmm. yes. I had met her through a family member, and uh, we dated for a while, and then uh, I asked her to join me in the service and get married. So she did, and uh, we started our family life there. My first daughter was born in Philadelphia. What happened was after um, graduation from x-ray school, uh, which was 64, um, that was uh, December 65. I was already married uh, about five months at that time. Um, they assigned me to, uh, I, was a, I became a staff technologist at the Naval Hospital Philadelphia. So they took my chart out of the student file and put me in the staff file. Big move. <laughs> so it was a great move because my wife loved Philadelphia, as I did. Uh, and I, I took all my time in the Navy to enjoy wherever we were. If I was, you know, I, I used to hear all these guys say, uh, well, I was stationed in Norfolk and I never saw anything but the base. Well, you know, uh, maybe you should go off the base. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I did. I, we went everywhere. We got to see Main Line. We got to see... We went to New Jersey, we went to Delaware, I mean, because it's so close, you know, five dollars of gas and that was enough for us to uh, really enjoy a great weekend. Every time we'd have a weekend off, my wife and I would go somewhere. And uh, she remembers, she's got very, very fond memories of all the places. After um, Vietnam was heating up especially well, I thought I was supposed to be assigned to Vietnam. That was my normal, that would have been my normal rotation. Because I had been to sea, had been to school, had been to shore. It was a shore. I was ashore at Philadelphia Naval Hospital for almost two and a half years after school, mm -hmm. and I had a year and a half left, about 19 months actually, and um, on those two on those tours, on my second tour, 
and I got a, uh, they said, you're going to be rotated. I thought, mm, here comes Vietnam, because this, of course, was 1967, mm -hmm. and things were really, really raging. Um, not as badly as the early 70s, but they were really heated up. I think we had probably 150,000 men in country. By that time, nearly 200,000, I would say, with ultimately 500. But um, got, so I, I said, well, I'm going to end up being assigned to the Navy, or to the, uh, what they call the f um, Fleet Marine Force, FM, FMF. Uh, U.S. Navy FMF are uh, hospital corpsmen assigned to the Marines because the Marines don't have their own um, medical division. And um, you are, in fact, a Marine. Uh, you go to special training. You wear a, Navy, a Marine uniform with Navy chevrons. Mm -hmm. But you are, as far as the, uh, Navy is, or the Marine Corps is concerned, you're their doc, and you're the best they've got. And uh, so I was anticipating it. I was kind of excited about it, but I was very nervous about leaving my wife and uh, small daughter. We had a baby, not even a year old. So I wasn't too excited about that. Um, but I said, well, what will be, will be. So uh, it's a funny little story. Real guy, one of my the guys down in crypt, what they call crypto, we call them spooks because they did all the crypto work, you know. They were a little spooky. And uh, so he came up one day and passed me in the passageway and he says, hey, Doc, he says, I got your orders. And uh, I says, oh, no. I said, where am I going? I said, I figured the name, you know, here I come. And uh, he says to me, no, he says, you're going to Argentina. I said, Argentina? I said, you got to be kidding. I said, we don't have anything in Argentina that I'm aware of. Maybe down near the Falklands. Uh, the British are down there. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, honest to God. He says, I got him. He says, look, he said, I'll go and show it to him. So he goes, pulls my orders off. He thought I was going to Argentina. I was going to Argentia, Newfoundland. He thought it was Argentina Naval Fleet Landing Dock. It was in Newfoundland. So we got that cleared up. So... Next thing I know, I'm on a, I'm on a, I had to take my wife home, brought her back uh, to Buffalo, re, uh, you know, reorganized her, got her set up here in Buffalo with my daughter, and I ended up going to um, Argentia, Newfoundland. I was assigned as the uh, only X-ray tech at the Naval Hospital in Argentia. It was a station hospital in Argentia, Newfoundland. We had, uh, we were part of the early warning defense system up there, and I spent um, 19 months there. My wife came up during the better weather for an eight-month tour with me, and I wintered over by myself twice. Most of the women didn't stay there for the winters because they were really bad. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of depression and a lot of, because most people don't realize during the winter you get about 20 hours of uh, darkness. It's only light from 10 in the morning till about 2 in the afternoon. And even then, it's just light. It's, you know, there's no sun. It's just light. Mm -hmm. That part of the island is completely uh, uh, cloud and fog shrouded, uh, you know, year in and year out, and day in and day out. But the summers are terrific. Summers are about uh, 50 degrees. It gets, I think we once got up to 58. And, um, but you have 20 hours of light, which is hard to get used to. Mm -hmm. you know, it's light till 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's light again at six, <laughs> but uh, that was different. I was assigned to the um, uh, hospital. I was the only hospital uh, to the X-ray department. I was the only X-ray technologist. We didn't have an, a radiologist. We had an internist, and they did all the reading of the X-ray films. And they kind of relied on us a lot to differentiate to what were shadows, what was this, and take another film, do this, do that. But we did everything up there. Even if somebody's dog was sick, we'd give an x-ray. <laughs> how many were there to. in the hospital? What were, how big was the staff? Um, there were, as I remember, 1,300 military members on the base, mm -hmm. which was a very small base. Mm -hmm. They had pockets. They, we were one of three bases. We were the Naval Station Argentia. Then there was the Naval Facility, which was called NAVFAC. And there was the Naval Communication Station. Uh, they're in acronyms, NAVCOM stay. Mm -hmm. Those were super secret places. You couldn't even go on, the, you couldn't even get past the gate. I remember once we got a call that there was a guy was down and we had to go get him. So we fired up the ambulance at the hospital, ran over to NAVCOM stay. So we get to the gate and I thought, oh, this is great. We're going to get to see the inside the gate. You know, they're going to let us in. Nah. They said, can you give us the litter? So we gave him the litter, the basket. 
They went in, come back out with the man. <laughs> Here he is to take care of him. <laughs> so uh, we never got to see the inside of the base. There were a lot of little secret places there. There was a place called Site Sam, which was a site with had surface to air missiles. They had those that were Nike missiles and some of the other early missiles at the time in the late 60s. I was there from 67 to 69, 19 months. But winters were horrendous, 40 to below Fahrenheit. That's not wind chill. <laughs> That's real temperature. Yeah, so cold. People don't realize what 40 below is, but 40 below is cold enough where you have to be very careful when you open a door or open the door handle, take the grab the door handle of your car, you take it right off because the metal gets so brittle it actually breaks. Windows break just from being so frozen. I never saw anything like it. A lot of times they get so cold at night, and if you get a little bit of wind, which would bring the windshield down to 75 or 80 below, the window would actually just crack just because it would just freeze solid. If there's any shaking of it, it would actually break. It was real easy. If it was when it was that cold, it just if you bang a window, it just crack. So you had to be very careful on how you handled, uh, uh, you know, doors and windows and door handles and things like that. Funny little things you think about. You know, you don't think about them when you're here because you don't see it. Um, very very uh, strange place. A lot of uh, very little. Uh, my first encounter of Newfoundland was I arrived in Newfoundland. First of all, we, we get up to uh, Arge the bases uh, in Argentia, which is on a peninsula. The nearest town, or city, excuse me, there are little towns, little fishing villages that you can only get to by boat around there. Then there's one access road, just one road, that's it. One lane up, one lane down. It's called the Argentia Access Road. It was gravel for 45 miles, and then you joined what they call the Trans-Canadian Highway, which is basically like Delaware Avenue, mm -hmm. actually a little less, and uh, it's only two lanes in most places, and it's just one lane in, one lane out, and that connects the entire island from one from the east to the west, which is about 500 miles, and uh, you ride about 50 miles or so of uh, Trans-Canadian Highway, so you got 45 miles of gravel, and then five, about 50 miles, about 95, 90, 95 miles into St. John's. And St. John's was a city of 120,000 people, which is, which was over 20% of the population of the entire province, was or like the whole state it was only um, 500,000, and there's 120,000 right there, and uh, that had all the amenities of a city. We'd go there um, maybe once a month or so, and they had a scheduled cab. It was these were the Newfoundland drivers. They would take their to cab, or they call it a cab, it was their own car, and they would drive it up to St. John's and do shopping for you and, you know, renew your driver's licenses or anything that they could do, pick up a tire, do this, do that, or you could ride up with them and come back, you know, spend the day up there and come back, or you could send them with a note and money and they go get things for you and bring them back, or um, we did that a few times, and my wife and I went a couple of times, went to St. John's just to change pace, uh, get up there and have a meal in a restaurant, which you didn't have in Argentia. Uh, but uh, all the little amenities that you think about, like even a five and dime or something like that, no such thing. So women found it very, very difficult up there, you know, just even normally just maintaining a house is difficult. Uh, but they were very accommodating. Uh, all of our furniture was back in the States, and my wife was only going to be up there for a few months, and I convinced them to give me furniture to use. Um, everybody chipped in and gave us uh, some, uh, three, oh yeah, three plates, three uh, servings of everything, you know, three place settings uh, for us to use. People, when they came to visit, would uh, bring their own uh, place settings because we didn't have it because everything was back in the States. But I got my wife to stay there. She originally was coming for a visit. And, um, but I got her to stay there for eight months during the better weather. And as soon as the weather got bad, I flew, flew her back out. We had a plane that flew up from um, uh, Newport, Rhode Island once a week, every two weeks, I think now. Oh yeah, every two weeks, a plane would fly back to the States and they would bring up perishables because everything was reconstituted. Um, reconstituted eggs, milk, all of that stuff was all powdered and put back to most, even some of the vegetables. So every, and potatoes, you know, like uh, instant potatoes, all that stuff was, it was not real. I mean, it was, it was 
real at one time, I imagine, but... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they would bring fresh, uh, thi you know, fresh things back, like fresh fruit and vegetables, and of course they get snapped up just like that. We had one store. We had the, we had the PX, like, you know, Post Exchange. Um, and that was it. And uh, Commissary, which was like a grocery store, like a little A&P. But there were, uh, and let me see, there were 900 civilian crew members worked there because we were responsible for uh, x-raying them and in case they got hurt, we were responsible to give them immediate medical attention. But th the medical attention we gave them was far greater than they could have gotten as civilians. They had what they called, uh, in that part of Newfoundland at the time, they had uh, what they called cottage hospitals and they had no OBGYN doctors attending uh, the women. All the civilian women, now you got to remember this is Canada, but it's not Canada as you know in Toronto or Montreal. It is entirely different. In 1967, 68, 1968, Premier Joey Smallwood had been the Premier or Governor of Newfoundland for over 20 years, unopposed. And he, just, uh, he was running for re-election again, and his campaign promise, I'll never forget it, as long as I live. He said, if you elect me, he says, in his Newfoundland accent, he said, he says, now he says, if you see fit to elect me again, he says, I promise you, he says, I'll have inside plumbing in half of the toilets in the entire province, <laughs> in the schools, uh, inside plumbing in the schools in the province. I could not believe it. But when you went to the small towns, you saw that they were one-room schoolhouses. Uh, the teachers had grade 11 certificates, so they were juniors in high school. As soon as you completed junior year in high school, you were now certified to teach. So you could go to these small one-room schoolhouses in little villages and teach, and thank God they had them. But uh, they had one university in, uh, in St. John's. That was it. Um, but it was good. It was interesting. Uh, it was interesting to see how other people live in different parts of the country, but the people were were just fantastic. Just great, great people. As they say, salt of the earth. They were really good people. The rest of my time in the Navy was uh, just mustering out. I uh, was reassigned um, from Newfoundland. There was a project that they had started then called Project Transition. Uh, that was a Navy-wide project that uh, was. They had a problem with returning uh, veterans in Vietnam era, in the, era, in the late 60s, that they were, which was a real problem, because they take guys right out of the jungle, and the next day you were in San Francisco because of the flights. See, they were little by little, they were eliminating the ships. Uh, but the ships gave you something important. They gave you uh, decompression time. Yeah, and I'd like to call it that. And when you came, where you came from Vietnam, for example, they would bring you back in the early stages of Vietnam. You'd have to take the ship back to San Francisco and then eventually trains or whatever back home. And it gave you a chance to gear down from a fighter, a warrior, mm -hmm. or witnessing all the war to becoming uh, a civilian again. And that's why a lot of men had a lot of problems. Uh, this instantaneous. And the, Vietnam, uh, the Iraq vets, I can sympathize with them because I know they're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Especially the a reservist, yeah. take them out of a, out of a civilian setting, put them immediately into war, back out. They're home for a year. They're back in in months, three, four, five months, a year or longer. Back out and back in again. Some of these guys have been there three times, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to create some serious problems: uh, post-traumatic stress and uh, just uh, feeling of alienation. You know, where do I fit in? Where do I belong? Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I went through a little bit of that of myself back uh, when I was around 45, 46 years old. I'm 63 now, and um, I did experience that. I uh, went to uh, VA counselors to kind of sort it out, figure out what was happening, and it was very, very, very common. And you just, it, you, you pass it. It passes. You get through it. I guess you, as you age, you, things get different. But um, there was, uh, to get back to that, uh, my last tour was... Uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for a week. I was on what they called Project Transition, whereby if you had not had, if you didn't have a job um, waiting you when you come out of the service, they would assist you in resume writing, getting yourself a position set up and make plans on what you were going to do. The program would assist you for up to three months 
why you just stayed there and did all of this, you know, got yourself ready to be uh, assimilated into civilian life. I fortunately was an x-ray technician. I had already sent resumes from Newfoundland and job applications to hospitals in the Buffalo area, so I already had a job lined up before I got out, even got to Project Transition. So I only spent a week there, and they uh, immediately discharged me from Philadelphia Naval Base to um, directly to, I was discharged three months early as a result. I got out in April instead of staying on until uh, September, so, or June, because I enlisted three months early as well. So, so how, do you, how do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Oh, very, very positive effect. Um, uh, neatness, attention to detail, um, a work ethic. I notice that when I work with um, any veteran, um, the it's just it's just different. Anyone that has been in the service, someone who has not been in the service, um, there's a there's just a difference. It's just harder to explain. Um, it seems that there's less thinking about. Uh, before you react to something. They say that when you've been in the service and you've been trained, especially if you've put in a full boot camp, no matter which one it is, whether it's the Army, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, the Navy, um, uh, your ability to respond quickly uh, is is different. Uh, it's, it's just, on, they say it's instinctive, but it's actually learned. It's learned through boot camp, it's learned through discipline, it's learned through reaction. And uh, it saves your life. It saves your, you know, your shipmates' lives mm -hmm. when you're uh, in, when you have to rea react like that. Not that a person who wasn't in a warlike situation, if he wasn't properly trained, would have a problem, but that necessarily wouldn't be the case. But I do notice a difference in um, in uh, veterans. They just seem to be more confident. Mm -hmm. if, if I can say one thing, one word, they seem to have more confidence. Okay. Uh, could you show us this photograph? Sure. Tell us when and where that was uh, taken. This photograph, uh, the, this young fella, was uh, 18 years old. It was at the Naval uh, Recruit Training Command, Great Lakes, Illinois. And uh, I was 18. We had just been given our uniforms. Those are dress blues. And uh, that's it. That little, uh, those two little stripes indicate that I'm probably lower than everybody else yeah. in the Navy. <laughs> I didn't even know what that really meant at the time. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank you.